as we focus on the breath, trying to keep it in mind, bringing the mind back every time we realize that it's wandered off, and then doing what we can to keep the mind there again. Our focus is on the breath, but the mind is getting trained at the same time. When you catch yourself wandering off, that's alertness. Remember where you should be, that's mindfulness. And then ardency is bringing it back as quickly and as effectively as possible. The effective here is important because that's where a lot of discernment gets developed too. Trying to gain a sense of your own mind when it needs harsh treatment, when it needs soft treatment. when it needs a little energizing from the breath, when it needs to be calmed down from the breath. You learn these things as you're working with the breath, so there's no need to have a separate meditation for the mind. The mind and the breath are right here together. So keep focused on the mind and the breath at the same time, but particularly on the breath because the mind is going to get trained willy-nilly as long as you're with a breath. And John Lee makes him a lot of this point. He says when you with the breath properly, you've got all frames of reference right here. You've got the body, you've got the feelings, you've got the mind, you've got the mental qualities that you're either trying to develop or drop away. And the mental qualities are the ones where you notice that the mind itself is a little bit out of balance. It's not staying with the breath, and you try to figure out why. Sometimes the problem is with the breath, sometimes it's with the mind. And so when you're working on the mind to give it more energy, the purpose is so you can get it more consistently with the breath and bring its energy level up so it can stay with the breath. The other times the reason it's not here is because it's got too much energy. It's frantically all over the place. You try to use the breath, you try to use other meditation topics to calm it down. But the purpose is to get it here consistently with the breath, and to drop everything that's weighing it down. What's weighing it down? One thing you may want to notice is when the mind finally does settle down and gets quiet, and it's with the breath and they seem to be one and the same thing, there will still be little blips of disturbance a rise in the level of stress. It may be very minor, but it's there. And then it'll fall away. And this is where you have to be very observant. What came along with the rise in the stress and what left when it fell away? Because that's where a lot of discernment is going to come in. And you have to be patient with the mind. And so you keep yourself occupied with the breath in the meantime, making sure the breath is as still and as smooth and as comfortable as you can imagine. And in this way, whether you're thinking about them or not, a lot of qualities of mind get developed. There's patience. There's a quality that the Buddha calls intentness. In other words, you pay careful, careful attention to what you're doing careful attention to what's here. You try to drop everything else around you. This is why one of our basic principles in daily life is that if you're going to take on battles with other people, you want to choose your battles well. Remember, the, the Buddha was a member of the noble warrior caste. He had experience in, in all the training that, that would be given to someone in that caste. And one of the first lessons you learn as a soldier, as a warrior, is that you don't take on every battle that comes your way. You're trying to figure out, if I engaged in this battle, even if I won it, what would be the price? And is it possible to win? Because the Buddha was a fighter. You know the story of his battle with Mara. And he said, however, the, the real battle was inside. The forces of Mara are not out there. They're in the defilements of the mind. And that's the battle that you want to take on. So 
if you're going to take on any auxiliary battles, you want to make sure they don't deflect your attention from this one. I've seen cases in the forest tradition where different Ajans would take on an issue. They would just let people roll over them. That's a sign that you don't just let people roll over you as, as well. But they chose their battles. There was a time when John Fung was in his hut, and he heard some people coming, and they were going to steal the generator from the monastery. He realized it was, he was alone. And there were a lot of them. He knew who they were. But he realized that going down and fighting them to save the generator was not worth it. And so he let them steal the generator. Other times when other people in the, in the area tried to get their hands on the money in the monastery account, he fought them off, even though they had verbally attacked him and talked many people into not coming to the monastery. He realized that that was a battle that was worth fighting, because he had to establish a precedent. And people can't just come in and take the money from the monastery. So in your daily life, as a meditator, you have to realize that some battles you have to take on and others you don't. Choose your battles well, so that when the time comes to sit down and meditate, you don't have too many issues cluttering up your mind, and you can take on the battle here inside. Which is, what can you do to keep the mind with a breath? What can you do to keep the mind still so it can observe itself properly? What do we observe when we observe the mind? As I said, we observe the rise and fall of the level of stress. If there's something disturbing the mind, what can you do to undercut it? Sometimes the, working with the breath directly will help with that. Sometimes you have to bring in other topics like contemplation of the body, goodwill, any of the recollections, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, recollection of your own virtue and, and your own generosity to give yourself a sense of self-worth, recollection of death to remind yourself you can't be heedless. In a lot of these cases, the purpose of these reflections is to fend off issues in the mind that are preventing you from getting with the breath so you can get back there. I've had a number of people recently complain about once the mind settles down with the breath, what do you do next? Well, you stay there. And learn that this is a skill that needs to be developed. All too often we think, well, I've got a little bit of stillness and now I can go for insight. But the insight doesn't come in any place else but in your efforts to keep the mind solidly based. Keep it still, and then look for any little disturbance that's going to come. And whether it comes tonight or comes tomorrow, or comes whenever it comes, you've got to be ready for it. That means you have to be still but alert. It's like going out and capturing animals for a zoo. You go to a place where the animals tend to be, and you wait. And you ask yourself, how long do I have to wait? And the answer, of course, is, I don't know. Who knows when the animals are going to come? The animals don't come according to a neat schedule. But you do know that they tend to come here, and if you're still and alert, the stillness will not scare them away, and the alertness will allow you to see them. It's the same with issues in the mind. You've got to be still so that you can actually sense these things. Otherwise, it's like trying to look at your reflection in a pool of water, but you're shaking the vessel in which the water lies. Your reflection is not going to be clear. You're just going to see waves. It's like trying to listen to a subtle sound in the house when you're humming to yourself. Of 
Kind of like trying to check if a piece of cloth is dry when your own hand is wet. You've got to get your hand dry. You've got to stop humming. You've got to stop moving the water. When things are still and things are clear inside, okay, that's when you're going to see the subtle things in the mind. And you don't have to know all the names for the different qualities that the Buddha taught. In a lot of cases, the Buddha taught people just the Four Noble Truths, and that's plenty right there. And a lot of his meditation instructions are variations on the duties of the Four Noble Truths, getting the sense of, as he said, seeing disturbance in the mind, which is another name for it, subtle stress. If the thoughts of sensuality are disturbing the mind, how do you cut them out? so you can settle down. Or the mind has settled down, but they're still talking to itself about the breath, talking to itself about adjusting the breath. A fair amount of that is necessary to get the mind to be together with the breath, but there are times when you realize, okay, it's there. You don't have to talk about it anymore. That's when you can settle in and be one with the breath. And that reduces the level of stress in your concentration. So the, these are things you want to look for, the rise and fall in the level of stress. That's what you look for to see your mind. Because it's hard to focus directly on the mind, but you focus on the things that you're focused on, and you'll see the impact of the mind. And you'll be able to gauge what state it's in by how well it's able to stay focused on other things that are close by. So don't worry about reading all the lists. Some of the lists are helpful to give you a sense of what may be needed at any one time to bring things into balance. In the Wings to Awaken, there are a fairly complete list of what the Buddha said is really necessary to know. Everything else is just an elaboration of that. But as you get a better, better sense of the mind as it relates to the breath, you don't even have to know the names of the qualities. You'll get an intuitive sense if the mind is too active or not active enough, too sluggish, too wired. It circles around issues like this, very simple. And the way you gauge how the mind is is doing is how well is it staying focused with the breath. When the breath grows still and your awareness fills the body, that's when you see the mind directly. But even then you'll be focusing it on other more subtle topics, space, consciousness. The mind will always need an anchor like that for you to observe it. As I said, don't worry about the names of the different qualities you need. Just try to figure out what's wrong with the mind, why it's not settling down with the breath, or once it has settled down with the breath, what is it in the mind that's disturbing you so you can't stay with the breath? They're very simple questions, and they're all related to this awareness of the body and the mind together, right here. There's nowhere else you have to look.